fundamentally one of the big problems with POTS is that medical professionals got it wrong for so long where they've chosen to misdiagnose people and what they've done is they've made the mistake of trying to follow books and not listening to the patient. My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today I have um, a wonderful guest uh, and her name is Joanna Ventilla. Hi Joanna, thank you for joining me today. Uh, for those watching this interview, I first met Joanna a few months ago when we were both attending a seminar organized by POTS UK. And it was there and then that um, Joanna told me about her personal and professional interest and involvement in POTS management. Uh, for those of you who do not know about POTS, this is a very common yet under-recognized condition which can be very debilitating and is characterized by heart palpitation, dizziness, collapses, severe fatigue, brain fog, temperature dysregulation, lack of refreshing sleep and gut symptoms. So very debilitating for the patient. And um, I was keen to try and bring more awareness of this condition and also make people aware of other healthcare professionals who have an interest in this condition, because it can be very difficult to navigate uh, when you have a condition like this and to try and find the right professionals to look after you. So Joanna, very warm welcome to you. And could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in POTS? Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So my story is a little bit long, but I'll try to shorten it as best as I can. Um, I kind of, it's almost, I would think of it in kind of even four phases. When I was a kid, I started having a lot of different kinds of symptoms. Um, I uh, had a lot of like pins and needles and tingling in my arms and my legs. And I would wake up multiple times a night for that during the school days at like kindergarten. It would be constantly bothering me as well. Um, I also was like, pretty nauseous almost every day and just couldn't keep much food. And I also was kind of like weak. So these were all kind of, you know, things that were happening in my childhood and nobody kind of, you know, it was more, I was more or less okay. Everything else I could kind of do. You know, I went to school, I had friends, I had like a normal childhood. So we didn't think too much of it. It was just me, my peculiarities. And then as I got older around uh, when I was a freshman at university is uh, when I started having um, symptoms in the summers, only in the summers. So the first summer was the first summer after my university, my first year at university. And I started having just this really, um, just like this, squeezing chest pain and it would radiate to my left arm and up the left side of my face and down the left side of my back and it was so terrifying because obviously when you look up pain like that that radiates you just see like okay, it's a heart attack or something and I was 19 um and it was just it was terrifying my heart would start racing I would start sweating um I would get like really clammy and cold um afterwards I would have these like, kind of like painful back spasms and like muscle pains and then I would just kind of be wiped out for a few days after an attack like this so that's when I first started going to cardiologists because you know something's wrong with my heart clearly um and that's kind of when the journey started so I went um that first summer they you know maybe did I think they did like an echo and like an EKG um and they said it's fine I'm just probably like too anxious or too stressed um and that there's nothing to worry about. Um, and every single summer it got worse. Uh, the whole time I was in university, um, it just kind of went from the first summer, maybe it was bothering me when it's let's say 27 Celsius and then kind of 25 and then 23 and then 21 Celsius. The temperature seemed to go lower and lower and I was more and more sensitive. Um, and only then when I started uh, working is when it got really bad. Uh, pretty much it got to the point where even in, when I was in an air conditioned building, I started having symptoms. And um, it, at that point, I got the point where every time I moved or turned around, my heart rate would like skyrocket. And I would just, um, I would have more of these episodes pretty much constantly, almost every day. And at that point too, the fatigue was pretty crushing. And at that point, finally, is when I was diagnosed. I told the doctor that I think it might be something called dysautonomia, that I, another doctor suggested that it might be. And um, although another doctor hadn't really suggested it, I had found it online, but I didn't really know how to reach it without sounding like, you know, hypochondriac. And that's when I finally was diagnosed first with inappropriate sinus tachycardia, which was then later switched to POTS. Um, so it's been kind of a, just a long journey to the diagnosis process. How long was that journey? 
from the from the beginning till I mean I know that you had those symptoms when you were in kindergarten but you were functioning fine but from when it started becoming really debilitating to getting a diagnosis how long did that take um so yeah technically my it was I think I would say around yeah five five years so uh, I mean you were getting all these symptoms and they were clearly scary symptoms so what what I mean, presumably the first time you got those symptoms, you went and saw a doctor. What did they think? What did they do? What did they think of your symptoms? Yeah, the first times it really started happening. Yeah, they just they um well the first ever time I went to a doctor, I, he gave me nitroglycerin um as you know to take. And I was I remember reading about that online and kind of thinking, well, don't like men in their 50s or 60s take this, but have other I remember being just so I remember just walking out of there and just sobbing because I was so scared. Um, but then after that, every time I visited somebody, it was more like, you know, like, honey, you're just anxious. Like, um, you probably have a lot of stress in your life. And it was always frustrating for me because yeah, I do have a history of anxiety and even depression that I've had when I was younger. And it was so bad at one point that I even, you know, um, I dropped out of high school. Actually, that's how bad it had gotten when I was younger, but, um, this was only in the summers. It was purely at first, only a summer incidence. And in the summer I was, um, only working, I wasn't working and going to school as I was during the school year. So if anything in the summer is when I had less stress. So to me, I just, in my head, I was like, okay, I do get the anxiety part. Maybe I, maybe I could kind of see where you're coming from, but I just don't understand why it's such a seasonal, why heat is a problem, why it's so seasonal and why these symptoms are only happening now. So. Did you ever try the nitroglycerin? Luckily, no. The first, my first experience with that was when I had the tilt table test. Yeah years later when I got diagnosed and that was just, you know, obviously that was very, that was very tough because yeah, I, during the tilt table testing, I, they gave it to me and then it reacted you know, not very well, obviously. I mean, that's crazy because nitroglycerin is used for angina, isn't it? And, and to tell a 20 year old that they have angina, which is a, a serious cardiac condition and then just give them a treatment for that just sounds crazy. Yeah, I was, I was so scared. And two, I think it was, um, you know how it is. A lot of times they don't really have the time to explain it to you. So it was just kind of, here you go, you can take this. And then I went downstairs to pick up the prescription. I read what it was and I did a quick Google search. And, you know, then I was like, oh, wait a second. This is, this means I have something really serious was the first thought that went through my head. So how many times do you think you went and saw a healthcare professional over those, you know, that journey over those five years? How many times do you think, you went in and uh, were just given that, that kind of you're anxious or that nothing really moved in the right direction for you? I think I easily saw around maybe six or seven cardiologists um, because also the other thing too, when I was in university, I didn't have the best health insurance. Um, so it was also very difficult. I felt like every year it kept changing. The people who I had seen were no longer in my provider network or things just kept changing every year. So it also, I had, it was difficult to kind of have that continuity of care because at this point I was living in the U.S. And so only that's, I think also helped me get diagnosed. Once I started working, I had pretty good health insurance. So I was able to go to like a really good hospital in Chicago. And, but by that point it had gotten a lot worse. And at that point, you know, they did the Holter um, monitor and they really could notice that, okay, at this point it's consistently like quite a high heart rate consistently. Um, you know, when I'm standing, I think it was like 175 beats per minute when I was standing waiting for the elevator. So at that point, it was really quite clear that like something more is going on. And before that, I remember I told the cardiologist, look, it only happened in the summer. And he looked at me and he said, and that's why I told him, like, right now I'm in the hospital and it's really cool here and cold and I'm not going to be able to get the same symptoms. So he looked at me and he said, what do you want us to do? Turn off the AC? And then he started laughing. And it was just like, okay, like, this is something that I'm really struggling with. And, you know, you're not being that funny. And, um, and it was you who volunteered the diagnosis initially, presumably. Yeah. Gosh. And so once you suggested the diagnosis and they presumably did the tilt test and then came out and said, look, you have POTS, what treatments uh, were tried out uh, and what worked and uh, what happened after that? So the way that happened is I saw a very young doctor at a really good hospital in Chicago where I was living. And she, I think to her first was probably like, oh, it's probably anxiety. So she gave me some anti-anxiety medications at first, which didn't, which made me quite calm, but calm with palpitations, which was just kind of frustrating. 
Um, and then once we did the chill table test, um, she's like, look, you could try this, these things. They're called, you know, it's called propranolol. They're beta blockers. Just try it. See how it works. I, she was quite like, we'll see. We'll see. So I, I took them and I felt an immediate difference. Um, and then when I went back, I remember she was so surprised that it actually made a difference. And you, it was also, I think, too, because a lot of people still didn't know. I mean, even now they don't know, but even then there was even less knowledge in a way where she was like, really, it worked? Like, I guess, I guess this is what you have. I guess this is, this is your diagnosis. So it was, she also wasn't very confident. I was kind of unsure. But luckily, the Capranol, in my case, uh, did help in the first year or at, first, at least the first few months, at least with the palpitations, I would say really um, helped. I was able to kind of go out on walks without, I would always get these, the back, the muscle, the spasms, the, obviously the palpitations, I would get all those symptoms. And with the propranolol, at least, so I thought at first I was like, okay, this is great. I'm going to take this medication. Everything's going to be great. Like, I just have to take this and that everything will be fine. But it kind of, that didn't last very long. Then what happened then? So the propranolol stopped working. Your symptoms got worse, presumably after getting better. Then what happened? Um, now that's interesting too, that I've noticed with other people too. Sometimes at first, like it's kind of okay. And then there's almost like the second wave or something else happens. In my case, um, I had then still, I, I was told kind of, you know, maybe it's because there's too much stress, too much anxiety. So I actually, um, I used to live in Chicago and I moved, I relocated to Europe because again, Europe has more work-life balance. Um, there's even kind of sick days in the U.S. It was, I had already kind of run through all my sick days, unfortunately. Uh, people at work were really uh, flexible with like you know, flex time. So I was able to have doctor appointments in the morning and then I make up my work in the afternoons. Uh, but then in Europe, um, pretty much I started having a lot more different kinds of symptoms. Um, I started having, I was like, I, I was a lot more dizzy a lot more of the times and just really, really fatigued and the brain fog got worse. And then um, the Renauds really, which I didn't know I had it at that time. The Renauds really, like it was just, at that point it was frustrating because anything, I pretty much had to be, if it was under like five Celsius, my fingers would really, really hurt. And you know, they would turn white and I would have all the symptoms. And then if it was kind of above like 20 Celsius, then the symptoms of the heat would start. So I felt like I had to be in a very special like, ecosystem of like between five and 20, I was kind of okay. Um, and then I started also having a lot of, at the same time I happened to have food poisoning, which pretty much did not resolve itself at all. It felt like for months afterwards, I was not able to keep food in. So I'd either kind of wake up throughout the night because I'd have a lot of palpitations or because I was not able to kind of keep food in. Um, so at that point is where I started having, I was diagnosed eventually then with, uh, mast cell activation syndrome with, um, EDS. That's when it was kind of the diagnosis with, with switch to POTS. At that point with the stomach is when I started looking into, okay, I've had nausea since I was a kid. So at that point is when they were like, okay, maybe it's gastroparesis. And then we did the emptying test and it was gastroparesis. Then from the food poisoning, uh, it was a SIBO. So I tested positive for that. Um, so then I all of a sudden just kind of all these diet, like just a flurry of new diagnoses. At first for five years, there was nothing. And there was one and all of a sudden there were seven. And this was in which country? Um, this was in Switzerland. So at that point I had lived in Switzerland. I was living in Switzerland, yeah. Wow. And um, did your treatment change then after that? Uh, did they give you other medications that helped you? So at that point it was really hard because in... In, in the U.S., at least, there is more knowledge. That's as much as people, you know, obviously there is a lot. There's a long way to go. I agree with that. But compared to Switzerland, at least my experience, um, I'm not, I, I think I might have heard there's maybe one specialist in the country is what I've heard of in, in, that deals with anything like this. So my experience, it was tough because, um, I mean, doctors pretty much straightforward told me this is a psychosomatic condition. Um, so it was, it was tough because I really didn't feel like, one, I didn't, I, I felt like I had to do so much of the work myself. And two, even with the, I remember going to one doctor when I wasn't feeling well, and she said, okay, look, we could kind of keep upping the dosage on the beta blockers. And I said to her, look, but the thing is we keep doing this and my blood pressure is just going lower and lower. And I already feel super dizzy and super weak. And then she looked at me, she's like, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And I just, it was so frustrating because I felt like, okay, but I shouldn't be the one having to, to bring this up. So you could tell at that point, I was just like, I don't know how else to, to help you. And um, so those diagnoses were, it took a little while to kind of get every one of them, but yeah. So did they find a solution for you where they could reduce your heart rate without lowering your blood pressure anymore? Uh, was there anything else that they had in their kind of armamentarium to give you? 
at that point, not, no, um, no, it was just, um, you know, maybe you, like if you need, you need to relax more. Um, um, and that was kind of, that was kind of it. I, in the U.S., it tends to be sometimes when people you know, really over prescribe and they over, I, I feel like sometimes it's, so it's a little bit of the opposite where I've had friends that have had really bad, you know, colds or flu or something. And they're like, just drink some tea and you'll be fine. So it's also interesting to know various countries and how they, how they kind of uh, treat illness and things like that. So how did your condition change then? How did you, because it seems that you're better now compared to then. So what has made the difference? How did you change? What, what happened? Um, so pretty much I got to the point where I was still working, but it was just, it had become increasingly difficult. Um, you know, there were, I was missing days at work. It was difficult because the brain fog was just making me so much slower, honestly. Um, and it was really, it was really difficult. So I got to the point where it was pretty much I was just, I was just incredibly tired. And I knew I could, I knew that I was heading towards the point where I really couldn't hold down a job anymore. It was just, it was inevitable. So I got to the point where I was just, I would wake up every day and I was just so tired and I would cry every morning going to work just because I knew that I already felt so terrible. And I would go to somewhere where I would, unfortunately would drain me of the last bit of energy I had that day. So I got to the point where I was pretty much like this every single day. And at that point, I, uh, I went to the doctor because I really wasn't feeling well. And he said, okay, you need to go on medical leave. Uh, because you like this is not sustainable you need to figure something out so I was put on medical leave and that's when I think I really kind of had a a, a good look back and I said okay clearly unfortunately going to doctors is not really doing much for me meaning I I might be getting these diagnoses but there's nothing that's really happening other than that so I need to try to figure out some ways because I could just I could I could see that I was just going lower and lower and lower and I was not heading in a good direction so at that point it's when I said okay what Kind of, you know, I had done some research over the years because I'd had to kind of figure out these diagnoses on my own and kind of you know, tell the doctors about them. So I kind of said, really, like, okay, what, what, what helps? I know that you know these lifestyle changes help. How can I really kind of implement them? Because I tried at first with exercise, and I just kept. It was the same thing. I, I crashed, and then I had a good day, and then I crashed, and I had a good day, and exercise just same thing. I did. I, I would do it, and then I would crash. So I really started. I would say probably slowly in the beginning. I was like, okay, I have to figure out a way to have more stability first before I introduce anything else to really kind of focus on what does pacing even mean. So that was the first step that I did was really allowing so much more like, intentional rest and space in my life and trying to figure out, okay, let's, let's, let's make a plan to, to get out of it. So that was really the first um, step. Um, and, you know, there's so much more kind of behind that into, into what that is. And then afterwards, I really focused on the nutritional piece. I had always, because I was nauseous since I was a kid, my go-to had always been like small snacks throughout the day and a lot of honestly sugar just because um, I was always nauseous. So if I ate something like a more hefty meal, I would you know, feel even more nauseous. So then it was like, okay, how can I get calories that give me quick energy? So I realized that I had to change too. So kind of looking again, very closely at my nutrition and trying to figure out how can I you know, improve things? Mostly now with all that we do know about um, you know, the gut bacteria and how that affects even you know, the vagus nerve and everything else. So really kind of trying to change and really to heal the gut and really making kind of a big difference in that. And then once those two things gave me a lot, the first one gave me stability. The second step kind of gave me more energy. And then finally, I was able to start kind of really um, kind of going at my own pace with the Levine protocol and just doing my own kind of version of it at home and trying to really implement movement. Um, So that's kind of the shortened version of quite a lot of work. (laughs) So what you're basically saying is that you have managed to get better just through sort of self-management and lifestyle with minimal aid from medications, which is sort of a dream for most patients, right? Wow, that's incredible. So, cause you see, that's, that's really, really interesting to me because when patients come and see me, I say, okay, well, there are all these lifestyle things you can do, but the thing I can do for you is give you medications. And understandably, a lot of patients are very apprehensive about taking medications. Many of patients, many patients with POTS tend to be hypersensitive to medications. They don't react very well to medications. Uh, And, you know, they're young people in general and uh, to feel like you're now having to take medications is is quite enslaving in a way. And uh, so, A, I think it'd be really empowering for a lot of people to hear your story and the fact that actually you took charge 
after having been somewhat neglected by the medical profession and you've managed to get better on your own, which is incredible. So how are you now compared to then? Do you, do you regard yourself as someone who is now free of all symptoms or do you still have to work really hard or are there still some symptoms that continue to afflict your life? Um, I think one of the best ways to kind of answer that is just pretty much the way my life used to be before I'd wake up in the morning and have to spend, I don't know, at least an hour or two in bed to kind of feel okay and start the day. Now I could actually get up and, you know, move right away. Um, I could now, for example, so I wake up in the morning usually and I, you know, I have my meditation practice. I have like a morning routine Then I'm able to work out, take a shower and go grocery shopping, which are three activities that I wouldn't even working out in the morning. I would not have been able to do that. It would just completely wipe me out working out and taking a shower in the morning. Why would I do such crazy things to myself? And then on top of that grocery shopping, like you know, that would probably put me in the flare for a few days. So, you know, I'm able to, to, to bunch these tasks together that before I remember I had to separate very clearly because I wasn't about to completely throw myself into a flare by mixing them. Um, so things like that where I'm able to, I think I just, I'm able to think a lot less about the actions that I have to take. And that's been such a weight lifted off my shoulders too. At first, yeah, there was more of a routine for sure. But like, okay, this is what gives you energy. This is what takes away energy. Let's do more of this and less of this. And let's figure out a way to, you know, get um, some assistance at work, at home, try to figure out some ways to make my life easier. But now I could kind of do, um, you know, kind of most things. The only thing I think I would say probably if I do, if I do notice if I don't take care of myself, so if I'm not sleeping well, if I'm not doing my regular routines, if I'm not eating well, I don't necessarily get like pot symptoms, but, um, you know, I just, I start feeling a lot more unwell and I just, I'm very, I'm much more cautious now. Like, I think I could see the borders much more clearly of like, and I value a lot more of like, okay, this is, this is how you need to take care of yourself. You need to listen to your body and to listen to what's going on. So if we regard optimal health as like a hundred percent, what was your lowest? What do you say you were at 10% and now you're at 90% or if, I mean, I know this is just crude measures, but it would just be interesting for me to know how much better, you know, subjectively you feel. I think that'd be probably yeah, an accurate, an accurate representation. Now, the one thing that still bothers me probably are stairs, I'm not a big fan of stairs, but that's nothing like <laughs> gigantic in the, in the whole scheme of things. And you're off medications. You're not taking any medications. So um, I'm on my lap. So I've been, I've been dosing off very, very slowly. So I'm about to be off probably in a week or so. It'll be my last. Um, yeah, I used to be on like a relatively high dose. And now I'm on a very, very tiny dose. And it'll be next week. I should be, I should be done. A propranol. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's incredible. So that's that's amazing because I think I think that is where most patients would want to be. They would want to be in a place where they get their uh, ability to do things uh, back without having to be reliant on medications. You know, that's where people would love to get. Um, I know that you have now take on you you now work as a health coach and you work with patients who were like you and try and get them better and is that is that what you do is that using um self-management dietetics exercise uh, meditation etc are those the things you do in your health coaching with your patients so yeah it's really interesting usually when we first meet um, the first thing we do is kind of, we go over, it's pretty much called a foundation session. So we sit down together for like 90 minutes and we, we talk through exactly where they want to be. So we really kind of set a clear goal and where they are now. And then usually I do, you know, I'm always open to give tips of like, okay, this is how you could get there through kind of what, you know, what we have seen so far in research and in science and with other people's experiences, mine, et cetera. But what I always find really interesting is that a lot of people, the more we start talking, the more they're like, you know what, actually, what I really like to work on is anxiety or meaning, you know, like my day to day, I've just noticed that I am you know, much more anxious. I do notice that I need to rest more. I know, or some people might be like, you know what, honestly, my nutrition, I know that I'm not eating as well as I do. So what I find really fascinating is I think the inner wisdom that everybody comes with, meaning I do have like a map and people are free to reference to it anytime. But what I notice is as soon as I kind of share the map, people take it, they draw all over it, they make it their own. And that's, what's been so inspiring too, that they really I would say they feel empowered and they, they go on and they chart their own way. And that's been really inspiring to see because everybody reacts so differently. I mean, there are certain similarities, but there's certain things that really like some people really love, for example, like cold exposure, like, you know, stimulating the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Some people, um, 
are, for example, vegan. Some people do not react well at all to that. Things like that, that it's really interesting to see once we start talking, there's a lot of times that people kind of are maybe drawn or feel drawn to something. And I think that is really powerful. And I really respect that. And we move towards in crafting goals related to the person's agenda. And presumably you find that one of the things is that as, as a doctor, when a patient comes to me, I just give them, you know, a sheet with all the lifestyle tips that I've compiled. Uh, but presumably, I, I guess that must be very difficult for someone to emulate when, you know, just when you're trying to look after children. And, and maybe do you think it's that taking that time out to talk to someone to reinforce some of those messages about working on your lifestyle about changing which is particularly helpful as well for sure and two um somebody actually recently mentioned that what they really enjoy is the fact that we come up with strategies so they were really trying to focus on improving their their diet they were skipping breakfast and everything else so you know we kind of pulled up a sheet together of various ingredients and various things that they could include and we were just talking and you know i was asking them various questions and they were answering and then at the end they're like wow no, I got this. I, I could do this. I totally know how to do this. I'm going to start tomorrow and I'm going to have this breakfast. Now I feel inspired. I feel ready. So a lot of times just, you know, thinking it through and two, what makes a big difference too, is I think um, even when I was at the seminar where we met, when I got to speak to other people with POTS, a common theme that I noticed is people say, you know, I, I feel like I need to go like a you know, thousand miles an hour. Like I'm very, they're very, just you know, young, active people, you know, intellectual, they're just, you know, active. And one of the things too that I think I notice is people sometimes, not just that they overdo it in a way, but two, they're doing various things, but they sometimes don't give themselves enough credit. And that's what's so important too in our sessions that it's really interesting. The first like two or three sessions, sometimes they'll come in and they'll be like, you know, I didn't really do what you said, or I didn't really do what we talked about a hundred percent. They're kind of, you know, a little bit hard on themselves and we celebrate, we celebrate everything they did. And then it's interesting, third or fourth session, they come in and they're like, I might have not done it like that, but I've done this and I'm really proud of it. And you just see this this, this change this hope coming up hope is a, a word I hear a lot and just this kind of initiative that they take and they're like you know what I am doing well I'm doing my best and I'm doing well and that is just such a great shift to see in just such a few sessions wow do you think I mean again one of the things that um, you see I, I just uh, recommend lifestyle changes do you think we're recommending the right things? Do you think, do you think uh, having met patients, your own experience, et cetera, do you agree with the recommendations? Do they seem to work? Is it just the reinforcement of those recommendations uh, that you incorporate in your sessions? Or do you think there are things that we don't recommend which seem to work for patients and maybe we've just got it wrong? Because fundamentally, one of the big problems with POTS is that medical professionals got it wrong for so long where they've chosen to misdiagnose people. And what they've done is they've made the mistake of trying to follow books and not listening to the patient. And I sometimes worry that I'm guilty of that because, you know, I see the patient, I said, do this, 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 this. Patient comes back, so I don't really feel any better. Is it because I'm recommending the wrong things or is it that it's just a case of the fact that the messages are correct, but they need to be reinforced. They need to be, patients need to be motivated. What is your insight? That's such a great question. I've never heard, you know, the doctor asked that. It also shows how, how dedicated you are and your love of learning and everything else. Um, so it's one thing I would say, I think um, a lot of the times, or at least in my kind of interactions, I've heard a lot of doctors sometimes say, well, you just need to move or you need to exercise. And I hear that being said is usually one of the first things. And what I've kind of noticed is that, um, although that's, that's great, I, in the first stages, that's just incredibly tough. And I think it can be so like almost demoralizing. You, you try to do it and you see that you have flare ups and it just, it doesn't make you want to kind of keep going. So I think that's one of the hardest things that I sometimes hear a lot is the thing with movement. I do, and there's two, there's two sides to this. One movement needs to be completely reoriented, meaning even kind of shifting positions and, you know, moving a little bit in your house and maybe doing some seated exercises. That's also important, but I think sometimes you could be kind of like, oh no, you need to start right on, you know, for example, the Levine protocol. That's that's a, actually a pretty tough one. Even month one is tough. I remember when I tried to go through it, it just, I kept getting stuck at month one. And then I was like, okay, I need to do my own thing because this is just, it's it's hard. So that I would say is one thing. That's why I think usually when people start, like if they've been recently diagnosed, we usually kind of start more on pacing and more on finding stability in the day-to-day -day. because those crashes, the ups and downs, any kind of, um, 
new habits you're going to try to put in place, they're just going to be kind of destroyed by, because when you feel terrible, that's a thing. It's hard for you to get up and make yourself, I don't know, some leafy greens to eat or something like that, or to move or things like that. So I think one of the first things for sure is just like finding that stability, pacing um, and doing things like that. And to even looking at things like, uh, you know, vitamins and things like that more thoroughly than perhaps just, you know, what your vitamin D levels are or something. So uh, one of the things, again, I was really interested in is this, of course, there is no doubt that for me in my own practice, the thing that seems to work really well for patients or the thing is just validating them, right? Just to say, look, I believe you and I'm here to help you and I'm not coming at you with this mindset that you are anxious or anything whatever you whatever you're complaining of i'm here to help you so that's how i'm going to that's how i'm going to approach that and that validation is very important for patients and they feel better automatically when they get that they feel supported etc but objectively right so there's one about making people feel better because they feel and that there is there's real that is really really important but objectively, uh, have you found, uh, what kind of objective progress have you seen? Have you found that people through working with you are now able to walk for longer or stand up for longer? Uh, are you seeing those kind of objective results in physical ability uh, through your work? Yeah, so one of the things I think I would see the most is probably, yeah, just, oh, I mean, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but kind of like stamina. For example, even one of my clients now is able to, um, she was kind of sitting a lot more and, you know, like, you know, watching TV and kind of being on social media and things like that. Right now she's able to go out and she started, you know, going out for walks and things like that. Because at first it was, um, you know, we kind of were looking exactly again, what kind of gives you energy, what takes away energy, kind of finding more stability. Now she has, she feels like she has more energy. There's less things that are kind of consuming her, you know, energy. And she's like, you know, I miss the nature. I miss going outside. So now she's, you know, started taking, you know, more walks and she's being more active. And I've seen this with quite a few people too, mostly this like finding things that they're, it's always interesting when I start talking to them about things that they, um, that they really love or they miss doing. You know, some people are artists, some people are writers, some people are like to read, some people love the nature and you just start them incorporating more of these activities. And these activities most of the time do require, you know, either maybe movement or some kind of like physical exertion. So I've noticed that. Um, and two, I think more like less of a focus perhaps on symptoms where it's like, you know, they're like, oh, I was doing this, this and this. And, you know, I look at them and say, you weren't doing that a few weeks ago. And they're like, yeah, I guess so. Like, I guess, I guess it was fine. I wasn't, I didn't crash afterwards. <laughs> and so it's almost like they're not even recognizing it sometimes. Wonderful. So um, on average, how many sessions are with you uh, do people take before you start noticing some kind of, positive result you know some kind of meaningful positive results um, how long does that take yeah so i generally it's kind of done um, in packages so there'll be maybe like a package of six or 12 sessions i will say um what i have noticed um is that people who for example got diagnosed earlier and they didn't have to go through so many years of being misdiagnosed and deteriorating um obviously those people do kind of make progress a little faster just because yeah um and two, what I've noticed usually kind of the first like four, I think I would say maybe four or five sessions is when people start noticing the change in energy, the increase in energy. But um, usually the maybe session five or six, around six is usually, there's like um, when people start working with me, I give them like this 15 page like welcome guide. And one of the pages talks about kind of the, the waves that you'll expect experience in coaching. So for example, sometimes um, they start and they're really excited. So then they might notice changes in like, you know, four or five weeks. And then sometimes what happens is like, well, you know, I'm feeling better. Perhaps I don't need to include this and this. And then sometimes they might, you know, have a, like a small slip up. And then that's always when it's so important that, you know, that we, again, you know, hold hands together and we kind of move back up on the, on the scale again, which is why it's important to at least, I would say probably like six, seven. So you could kind of at least get past those, um, you know, that little valley. I think that's amazing because I think there's no doubt that you need easily available ongoing support. And at the moment with the NHS, the way things are is that you'll be referred to a physiotherapist and they won't see you, they'll see you once every six months and that's just sort of five or 10 minutes. That's not what you need. If you're gonna get better, you want to be having um, access 
regularly and you have to incorporate that don't you to really start seeing results otherwise it can be very difficult because the minute you slip uh you know if you don't get that supported for six months you're back to square one so i think that's uh that i think is a really helpful thing i mean it's a shame that they don't have this available on the nhs for people to refer my patients to because it would be so invaluable you know i pay patients come to me um and you know uh, we it works reasonably well because they feel that like you know i understand the condition to the best of my limited abilities and i give them some education and i i can prescribe medications but a lot of people don't take the medications i prescribe you know so uh, when i ring them in four weeks they say oh i haven't really taken the medications and i say well um how do you feel still feel rubbish now and my own automatic well you know if you don't take the medications of course you will but I can you know I have to be humble enough to understand that that if it doesn't work for the patient it doesn't work for the patient that that you know it shouldn't be oh it's my medicine or nothing it should be well here are options you choose the option and let's work with that so I can't see anyone not wanting to work with someone like yourself where there's more of a focus on empowerment and self-management. Um, do you have to be present in person for your sessions or can you do them remotely as well? Um, yep, yeah, it's pretty much all done remotely. And then too, the person has access to me between sessions as well. So we use um, software that we use to communicate. And uh, yeah, so I'm always like an, e you know, an email, a message away. So, and even I could do even like you know, kind of calls in between sessions of like shorter calls if something pops up. I really want to be there for people so that we, you know, somebody has a slip up, you know, we could, we could fix it. There's no, there's no concern. There's no worries. Uh, one thing I have to ask is, is it an expensive thing? Is it expensive to uh, engage someone like yourself to, because that's something I'm very conscious of. You know, I, uh, a lot of my patients, unfortunately, uh, haven't been able to work uh, and therefore uh, cost is uh, you know finances are important and uh, putting them through financial hardship can result in more stress and have paradoxically have the wrong thing so is it a is it an expensive business or is it generally quite affordable it's quite affordable yeah mostly at the beginning right there's maybe the upfront fee so even a lot of the times it'll be you know like maybe six sessions and it's easier to maybe pay in one chunk but even too sometimes with people let's say that something happens um, or they're really not feeling well or they find the coaching isn't even for them I'm always uh, I've you know, always even fine to kind of you know, refund people back for the portion that we, we haven't used um, and um, even so what I've also noticed I was actually talking to somebody like last week where they mentioned how we were talking and she said you know actually I'm, I'm still seeing I still have quite a few doctor appointments um but actually now that I am I'm actually feeling better and I don't need to also kind of attend these other ones and something like that and that was also interesting too because it makes you think how much money you're also saving you know in the long run and time and everything else having to take time off work to go and visit although this will not make health coaching will not make doctors extinct extinct there is still um it's you know a lot of the research studies point the fact that um once, for example, like doctors work with health coaches, uh, patients actually feel uh, like not only more empowered, but they feel like, you know, even when they speak to their doctor, they feel like their queries are being answered because maybe they're you know, working with the health coach and they feel empowered. So they feel like there's a team behind them. So that's why it's interesting too, to see how the future of this will, will shape and how there'll be more collaboration. I agree. I mean, I, you know, you bring something completely unique um, to this um, you're someone who has had to endure it. So by very nature, you're going to be so much more empathic and you're giving more time than I can ever give. And, uh, and in that sense, I, I can certainly see why, you know, why it would be so valuable for patients to be in contact with people like yourselves uh, and I would want to come and see you rather than come and see myself if I were like that. So uh, one question I wanted to ask you is, have you seen any common links between long COVID and POTS? So it's really interesting because a few of the people that I work with also have or are there primarily because they have long COVID. So even I think the newest estimates, what did they say? The, it's changing almost, I feel like, every week with new research and data coming out, but maybe that 50% of long COVID people might have some kind of autonomic dysfunction or something like that. So I've been seeing a lot of, um, the only thing that I think 
well, maybe it's too, I for sure would long COVID see a lot more like kind of ME and like that, you know, really crippling fatigue. But other than that, it's, it's almost creepy how similar the symptoms are. And when people start talking and they start saying these things, it's like, wow. Well, I think, I think it's very interesting because I think um, in my experience, I see a lot of long COVID patients mm -hmm. in my POTS clinic and I manage them as POTS. And a few really interesting things have come to mind. Well, well, the first thing is that when you ask a lot of patients who develop long COVID, they'll often go back and say, yeah, but I wasn't quite right even before I got COVID. That's really interesting, which makes me think that maybe they had an underlying vulnerability, which has been unmasked by this virus, like a lot of POTS is with glandular fever, et cetera. So that I think is interesting. There was some research uh, which was published, which was a long-term follow-up of long COVID patients. And they found that A, the severity of COVID does not really have any, uh, it is not a guide to whether you'll get long COVID or not, which is again, really interesting, right? Because if you thought it was, if it was all about the virus, you would expect the severer the illness, the more likely you are left with these residual issues. Uh, that's interesting. The second thing was that the, there was up to, I think, over 10% of patients with long COVID were not able to resume their normal jobs at the end of one year, which again tells you that this is certainly something else that has flared up. Um, and I think it's really interesting because I, I certainly think that there are lots of patients with long COVID who seem to respond to the treatments offered for POTS. I do this in my own now the problem is that there are all these long COVID centers um, being opened up, long COVID clinics. And I suspect that the motivation for opening these clinics up is largely because there's funding available. So lots of hospitals want to get the funding, so they'll just start up a long COVID clinic. But actually, when you talk to long COVID sufferers, what do these long COVID clinics do? They're not really intensively you know, engage with these patients. They'll ring them up every few months and say, look, are you pacing? Are you keeping hydrated? And that's about it. And my concern is that I, I would encourage people who have long COVID to explore the possibility of autonomic dysfunction POTS and go and see people who have an interest in that condition. Because if you separate them, then some of the treatments that work for POTS may actually work for long COVID patients, but because we are such slaves to guidelines and uh, evidence. People will say, oh, well, that's never been tried in long COVID because it's a separate condition. So we're not going to try that. And, you know, there may be a person who then struggles on for five years before some research comes along and says, oh, maybe there are, maybe these patients also benefit from these treatments. So again, I think that's interesting because uh, through your work, you may come across patients like that and acknowledging the fact that there is a, a real similarity, you know, between the two conditions is so important. I mean, I would love to signpost some of my patients in your direction. Um, and so, of course, there is no real way at the moment with, in the NHS to access this. Is there any way they can come and talk to you and get some uh, insight initially without having to incur an expense? And then uh, if, you know, if, it's something that you develop a rapport with, then they could put potentially, if they're able to engage your services. Thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, so actually, one of the best ways, you know, first step is usually kind of to book kind of what we call a strategy call, where it's pretty much like 45 minutes, it's free. Um, and uh, we talk, we kind of go over in a mini version of where are you now? Where would you like to be? And we, we talk through strategies and steps of how to get there. And most people do say that they come away with actionable items and steps and things that they could do going forward, even if they decide not to work with me. And if they are interested in working with me, we could also discuss that. But if not, then you know, at least they'll come away with, okay, at least maybe I know my next step. I know what I have to do. So it's some kind of, um, it's information. And yeah. It's information. And I think it's so important that, you know, they're working with people who speak the same language as a, a POTS doctor, et cetera, you know. Uh, because otherwise you can end up with someone who doesn't know much about POTS. But is, so I think that's really important that people are speaking the same language and certainly some of the messages get reinforced. So that I think is really good. So how, how do I get my patients to contact you? Yeah, so one of the best ways would probably be through my email, which is you know, hello at ivantilla.com. Um, and there's I can also be reached via Instagram. That's where I also have a lot more posts if people would like to get to know me better um, through Facebook. Um, 
I also have a new like, training that I actually put out about things that people's doctors might not be telling them about POTS. So that's like a free training where people could learn more. I'm pretty sure you're telling them these things, but other doctors are not. Um, and those are kind of some of the some of the ways. So yeah, I'm kind of on most of the social media platforms and then via email as well. So um, what is your Instagram um, account called? Yeah, it's at ivintilla underscore. Well, we'll try and put that on the video so that people can contact you. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I, I really look forward to working with you and hopefully this will be like a, a first but very important step in building a team of like-minded healthcare professionals who can work together, talk to each other, but form a support system around those patients who have um, for too long had to advocate for themselves in the face of you know, irreverent healthcare professionals, et cetera. So I think there's real scope. We don't have to wait for the NHS to suddenly wake up and say, okay, we should be offering this. We should be empowering patients that there are people like yourself out there who are really interested in working with these patients and you know, working for their success. So, um, I'm so glad you came and talked to me at the POTS. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you so much. And hopefully maybe what we could do is do more videos together and, you know, you could share some of the insights uh, of the things that work in your healthcare sessions and we can just sort of make people aware of them. That sounds really exciting. And I'm, I'm so happy to have been here and to have connected with you and I'm looking forward to further collaboration. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much.